a sun-soaked hillside in ancient Galilee, brimming with people eager to hear from an extraordinary teacher. The air is filled with anticipation as Jesus begins to speak. What follows is not just another religious discourse, but a message that would turn the world's values upside down the Sermon on the Mount. Often quoted, sometimes misunderstood, and rarely fully grasped, these teachings carry layers of wisdom that have eluded many for centuries. Today, we're going to unravel what Jesus truly meant in this revolutionary sermon. As we dig deep into these words, be prepared to see how they challenge not only the way society functions, but also our own perceptions. This isn't just about understanding history. It's about understanding a way of life that still has the power to transform us today. Jesus opens with the Beatitudes, a series of blessings that might sound poetic, but are anything but conventional. Each one of these statements challenges the norms of the world and flips them on their head. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In a world that celebrates confidence, strength, and self-reliance, Jesus starts by blessing those who acknowledge their own spiritual poverty. This is not about putting ourselves down. It's about recognizing our deep need for God. It's a radical departure from the self-help mentality that tells us to be our own saviors. Jesus is pointing to a deeper truth, that true strength begins with admitting our weakness. Then, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Mourning isn't something we usually associate with blessing. But Jesus isn't talking about superficial sadness. He's addressing a grief that goes beyond personal loss grief over our sin, the brokenness of the world, and the suffering that surrounds us. The promise here is divine comfort, a comfort so deep that it makes even mourning a blessed state. As we go deeper, we see Jesus blessing qualities that the world often overlooks or even scorns. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. In a world obsessed with power, the idea that meekness leads to inheritance is almost unthinkable. Meekness isn't weakness. It's controlled strength, humility, and patience under pressure. It's the kind of strength that refuses to dominate others. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. These words challenge a world driven by quick fixes and instant gratification. Jesus is talking about a deep, unquenchable longing for justice and integrity, not just in our own lives, but in the world around us. And the promise is that this hunger will be satisfied. Jesus then blesses the merciful, the pure in heart, and the peacemakers. In a society where aggression is often rewarded and purity is seen as outdated, these values are radical. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. In a world that glorifies conflict and division, Jesus highlights the divine nature of those who strive for peace. But then he makes an unsettling statement. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is preparing his followers for the reality that living out these values will attract opposition, persecution, insults and suffering might follow. But even this, he says, is a sign of blessing. The message is clear. True discipleship may cost us something, but the reward is far greater. After the Beatitudes, Jesus delves into the law, but not in the way people might expect. He isn't here to abolish the law. He's here to fulfill it by revealing its deeper, more demanding intent. He takes what people thought they knew and pushes it to a level that reaches the heart, not just the actions. Let's start with anger. You have heard that it was said, you shall not murder. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Jesus is saying that harboring anger or contempt is just as damaging as physical violence. It's not enough to avoid committing acts of murder. We're called to uproot the bitterness and resentment that can fester within us. This teaching forces us to confront the hidden parts of ourselves 
the grudges, the silent hatred that we might think are harmless. Jesus then moves to the issue of lust. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In a culture overwhelmed by sexual temptation and imagery, this teaching hits hard. Jesus isn't just talking about avoiding sinful actions. He's calling for purity at the level of our thoughts, intentions, and desires. It's a call to guard our hearts in a world that often encourages the opposite. The teachings continue with divorce, oaths, and retaliation. In each case, Jesus digs deeper than surface-level obedience. He's pushing us toward a righteousness that transforms us from the inside out. It's not about legalism or ticking boxes. It's about cultivating a heart that reflects God's holiness. But perhaps the most challenging command is to love our enemies. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This isn't just countercultural; it's counterintuitive. Jesus is calling us to a love that goes beyond human logic, a love that mirrors the boundless grace of God. It's easy to love those who love us back, but loving those who hurt us, who hate us, who wish us harm, that's where true transformation begins. This kind of love isn't just an ideal. It's the hallmark of someone who truly follows Jesus. Next, Jesus takes aim at the human tendency to perform our spirituality for others to see. Whether it's giving, praying, or fasting, he warns us against practicing righteousness for the applause of people rather than the approval of God. When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do, to be honored by others. This hits especially hard in a time when every good deed can be broadcast on social media. How often do we do things just to be seen? Jesus is urging us to seek a higher motivation, giving in secret, not for recognition, but because it's right. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. The reward isn't the fleeting praise of people, but the lasting approval of God. When it comes to prayer, Jesus continues this theme. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to pray standing in synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Instead, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. The focus here is on private devotion, sincerity, and genuine connection with God. The length or eloquence of our prayers isn't what matters. What matters is that our hearts are truly seeking God. Jesus then gives us a model prayer, the Lord's Prayer. It's simple yet profound, covering everything from worship and submission to God's will, to daily provision, forgiveness, and deliverance from evil. It's a prayer that reorients our focus away from our own desires and toward God's kingdom and righteousness. Finally, Jesus addresses fasting. Again, the emphasis is on keeping our spiritual practices between us and God. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting. The message is clear. Our spiritual life isn't a performance. It's about cultivating a deep, authentic relationship with God that isn't swayed by what others think. Jesus then moves to some of the most common struggles we face, worry and judgment. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. In a world filled with anxiety and uncertainty, these words are both comforting and challenging. Jesus points to the birds of the air and the flowers of the field as examples of God's faithful provision. They don't worry, yet God takes care of them. How much more valuable are we? He's not advocating for irresponsibility. He's calling us to trust in God's goodness 
and shift our focus from anxious striving to seeking his kingdom first. When it comes to judgment, Jesus warns us not to judge others harshly. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. He's not saying we shouldn't discern right from wrong. He's warning against hypocrisy. We're quick to spot flaws in others while ignoring our own. Jesus calls us to examine ourselves first before we point out faults in others. Yet, he also reminds us not to be naive. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. While we're called to avoid judgmental attitudes, we're also called to exercise wisdom in how we share the truths of God's kingdom. Jesus doesn't sugarcoat the reality of following him. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The path to true discipleship isn't easy. It's a journey that requires commitment, intentionality, and often going against the current of popular culture. He then gives a sobering warning about false prophets, telling us to recognize them by their fruits. It's not about how charismatic someone is or how persuasive their words are, it's about the results of their lives and teachings. As Jesus wraps up his sermon, he delivers a statement that should make us pause. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It's not enough to profess faith. Our actions need to align with our words. Jesus goes on to say that many will claim to have done great things in his name, but he will reply, I never knew you. This isn't just about external deeds, it's about the condition of our hearts. Jesus challenges us to build our lives on the solid foundation of his teachings, not just hearing his words, but putting them into practice. The Sermon on the Mount is more than just a collection of teachings, it's a blueprint for a radically different way of life. Jesus challenges our understanding of blessing, deepens our grasp of God's law, and calls us to authentic faith that isn't swayed by the applause of others. As you reflect on these teachings, consider how you can apply them in your daily life. Are you building your life on the rock of Christ's words, or are you relying on shifting sands? Remember, true transformation comes not from our own efforts, but from surrendering to God's grace. If this message resonated with you, don't forget to comment your thoughts, share it with others who might need to hear it, and subscribe to the channel for more insights. Let's continue growing in our understanding and application of God's Word together.